We again move away from Guildford MPD to hear of some experiences from a man I first met when I was working at Surrey Police as a crime information system and police national computer trainer in 1996. We didn't realise it until we started chatting in the canteen one day that we had led parallel lives. Dennis had started work as an engine cleaner at Weymouth in 1960, just before I'd started my career as an engine cleaner at Guildford in 1961. He graduated to become a fireman, as I had, and then after steam ended in 1967, moved to Dorking EMU Depot in 1969 to obtain his driving job, and I moved to Effingham Junction EMU Depot in 1972 to obtain mine. We didn't realise it then, but we probably saw each other at various places during our initial driving career and probably had a PN break at Waterloo Driver's Room at the same time on a number of occasions. Dennis's interest waned a little, being at a juice-only depot, and as it was no longer the job that he had joined as a boy, he decided to change careers, as I did later following privatisation in 1994, and he joined Surrey Police, firstly as a probationer, and finally ending up as manager of Number 5 Police Dog Training School at headquarters Mount Brown, Guildford. Here are Dennis's fascinating ramblings. Dennis was born in Weymouth, Dorset, in 1945, and the busy GWR Quayside in Weymouth Harbour was something he grew up with and took for granted. Little 1366 class pannier tanks pulling the boat trains through the streets from Weymouth Station to and from Weymouth Quay was commonplace, either taking passengers to the railway passenger boats or collecting them after their arrival from the Channel Islands. Freight services through Weymouth from the Channel Islands, France and further afield kept the port busy and at certain times of the year it struggled to meet the workload. New potatoes from Jersey, tomatoes from Guernsey, cauliflowers from Roscoff, cider apples from Normandy and much more. These sights together with the sounds of boat hooters and train whistles were very common occurrences and at midnight on every New Year's Eve there would be a cacophony of such sounds heard all over the town. As a boy, Dennis recalls catching the little branch line train down to Abbotsbury, usually hauled by a GWR 1400 class tank, normally working a push and pull service. The house at which he was born was also not far from Rodwell Station, which was on the Weymouth to Portland branch line. Little did he know then that he would be the fireman on the last passenger train across this beautiful little branch line. The Portland branch was run as a joint railway due to an agreement in 1862 which leased the line in perpetuity to the GWR and the LSWR who agreed to work it jointly. The Royal Navy base and dockyard ensured that the Portland branch kept busy as did the Portland stone quarries that pervade the island. Some heavy trains of open trucks loaded with the huge blocks of this lovely white limestone came out of Portland to end up all over the world, with much of London being built from it, with the most famous images being that of the Cenotaph and of course St Paul's Cathedral. The signalman at Rodwell was a good friend of Dennis's parents, and Dennis and his brother used to go up to the station as he allowed them into the signal box where they were awed by the sights and sound of the railway, albeit that it was a fairly quiet branch line of the sort that John Benjamin would have enthused about. Dennis's other contact with railways was through his Uncle Arthur, the husband of his mother's sister. Dennis's Uncle Arthur was a driver on the GWR, and by the time he retired in the 1960s, he had completed his full 50 years on the railway, and his nephew, Dennis, had been his fireman on a few occasions. Uncle Arthur's party piece was the ability to recite Skimbleshanks, the railway cat, word perfectly. There's a whisper down the line at 11.39, when the night mail's ready to depart. But Dennis digresses. Like a lot of small boys, he used to go up to Weymouth Railway Station to watch the comings and goings of the steam hauled trains in the mid to late 1950s, unaware that their days were numbered. Weymouth was a very popular seaside resort then and its location was the terminus for mainline trains from London 
both the Southern Railway from Waterloo as well as Paddington, the GWR main London terminus. This ensured a wide variety of locomotives from these two great pre-grouping railway companies. Dennis was to learn that although the British Railways Board ran the railway system, loyalties died hard for those men who served under the old companies. But for a keen railway enthusiast, Weymouth also offered more, especially in the summer months, as many summer excursions ran into Weymouth down the old GWR metals from Swindon, Bristol, Wolverhampton and Birmingham, so it was not unusual to see them hauled by former LMSR locomotives, Stanier Black Fives, with other infiltrators such as Stanier 8Fs and BR Standard 9Fs and GWR 8Fs on heavy freight schedules. On rare occasions, former S and D J R Fowler 4Fs would arrive with too much excitement. The late 1950s saw Southern King Arthurs, Lord Nelsons and the occasional schools. All this mixed in with the GWR halls, castles, manors, Grange class engines together with standard fives, GWR moguls, prairie panniers and 1400 class tank engines. Sadly, GWR Kings were not permitted into Weymouth at the time due to the axle loading over a couple of bridges. The railway embankment footpath and the nearby Alexander Bridge which spanned the railway was on a summer Saturday in the late 1950s a young railway mad boy's dream place to be. Standing on the bridge you could look tantalisingly into the distance where you could see the steam and smoke rising from Weymouth loco sheds and you would see an engine start to move off towards the station to pick up its train, and Dennis would wait excitedly for it to steam under the bridge to find out the number. On other occasions, Dennis would wait on the platform at Weymouth to see the arrival of a Waterloo train in the hope that a friendly driver would allow him on the footplate. Dennis recalls that one engine they allowed him onto was N15 class number 30453, King Arthur, one of the Eastley Arthurs, which was withdrawn in July 1961, a year to the month after Dennis's commencement of work on the railway. So it was then that in the summer of 1960, Dennis reached a grand age of 14 years, but being 15 in July, he was able to leave school at the end of the spring term, which was in June. Fortunately, he had already got Uncle Arthur to arrange an interview with Mr Atwell, who was the shed master at Weymouth Loco Sheds. He was not alone though, as a boy in the same class as him at his school heard that he had an interview and he muscled in on it. So what, you might say? Well, for several years after they both got the job, it was a major irritation for Dennis as they both started the same day, but as he was about a month older than him, he gained seniority over Dennis, and as any railwayman will know, means that they got the first firing jobs that came along when they were past cleaners, and he also got the substantive fireman's job before Dennis. However, what he did still vividly recall all those years later was on a summer's day that he actually got to lawfully open the gate to Alexander Bridge that led onto the railway footpath that took him to the loco sheds. Having passed the interview with Mr Atwell, he went to Eastleigh to see the railway doctor and his eyesight and health were good enough to start work. Arriving at the shed, Dennis can still recall standing by the huge locos and realising the awesome power of those beautiful machines, the driving wheels of which seemed to tower over him. Dennis was now a railway employee at Weymouth Loco, 71G, formerly GWR 82F. Having started his life on the railways as an engine cleaner, Dennis soon had to realise that this was not a playground, but a serious and often dangerous place of work. Uncle Arthur Toop had already told him the story of how he had pulled Bill Wareham out from under a locomotive when Bill slipped off the steps as he tried to jump on a moving loco in the sheds one dark and wet night many years before. Sadly, Bill had his right leg severed, and after he recovered, he and his wooden leg spent the rest of his railway career as a driver on the Weymouth passenger shunter, where he used to enjoy emptying the smoke box ashes over the neighbouring houses that were alongside the railway. 
This caused more than one letter of a complaint to the Dorset Evening Echo from irate housewives who had their washing out. However, Bill, commonly known as Banana Bill, Dennis believes because of his love for the fruit, always remained cheery. Being a new boy in the job, Dennis had to find his way, not only about the place, but also about the people. Dennis was born at the end of World War II, but in 1960, he found himself working with men who were born at the start of the century and were coming to the end of their working lives. These men started work around the same time as World War I broke out and had seen two world wars working on what was a crucial industry for the country at the time. Dennis was now a similar age to those men he started work with, but looking back, he could see them as old men, mostly in bad health. Bearing in mind the conditions they worked under, that is no surprise, as they had given their all. If some of them were grumpy and had little time for a young lad, then he could forgive them for that. But in all honesty, they were in the minority, and Dennis found the majority still enthusiasm about the job they did, and above all, proud of being a railwayman. This attitude soon rubbed off, and Dennis discovered that railwaymen were a special breed that looked after one another. At Weymouth, the old GWR Mutual Improvement Classes, MIC, were still strong, and men like Gordon Brewer would conduct courses for the young lads in his own time to learn all about the workings of locomotives and the rules governing the running of the railways in preparation for their exams to become past firemen, still cleaners, but past for firing duties, as and when they were available. Dennis still recalls the drafty and cold former Clerestory railway coach that was stuck up on a concrete box used for the classes at the back of the loco sheds with an old round stove in the corner that you could get glowing red. The draft blowing through the cracks would still get to you. In the meantime, not only were cleaners expected to do engine cleaning duties, they were also used to deliver call papers to engine crews. This entailed getting on your push bike and cycling all over Weymouth to wherever the driver or fireman required lived to deliver the call papers. On it was written a change of duty for the following day, often at short notice due to sickness or a special train that was suddenly laid on. Most of the time Dennis was told it was okay, but if it did not suit, he was instructed to go back and tell the foreman that there was nobody home. As the call papers required an answer, it was not permissible to leave a note through the door, so although this often entailed extra work for the call boy or cleaner, he would go back and tell the foreman that there was no reply to the knock on the door, because his first loyalty was to the footplate crew that he so wished to emulate. During this period, Dennis also used to get to know the many fitters, boilersmiths, fire raisers, fire droppers and coalmen. Most of these men had useful information to impart to a young lad, keen to learn all there was to know about steam engines. These engines were labour intensive and needed a great deal of work to keep them in fine fettle, although by the early 1960s the writing was on the wall for them. And so as more and more disappeared for scrap, less and less time and money was expended upon them. One group of men mentioned here were the fire droppers. Being a former GWR depot, Weymouth enginemen did not have to clean out their own fires or smoke boxes, except when they left engines at Bournemouth or another southern depot. The coaling stage at Weymouth was built to the GWR design, with an embankment to the side, with track running up to the top, where loaded coal wagons could be propelled up to the top for the coalmen to shovel the coal into small hand-propelled wagons which would then be pushed out onto a ramp to be tipped up and emptied into the tender of the engine waiting below. It was hard work and Dennis had to do it many a time when there was a shortage of coal men. Dennis found that the younger drivers and past firemen had a very different approach to the youngsters as they had experienced the difficulties that some of the older drivers could hand out and they did not want to perpetuate that to their credit. Dennis was fortunate enough to eventually become a fully-fledged fireman and was crewed with a young driver called Ivor Foote. 
His father, Hector, was a royal train driver, and Ivy used to have a photo of his dad on a royal train out of Weymouth, which was decked out overall. As often happens in the railway environment, Ivor became a lifelong friend, and when Dennis heard of his passing in June 2006, it was as upsetting to him as losing a brother. Before that happened though, Dennis was trying to learn his trade, and worked hard to get any firing turns that he could. As a new boy, these were mainly on the various shunting engines at Weymouth, and of course working on Weymouth Tramway, from Weymouth Town down to the quay. At this time, as previously mentioned, the quay was a hive of industry, and even into the mid-1960s, new sidings were constructed to try to cope with the heavy traffic. When Dennis thinks back about the amount of men working at Weymouth on railway and shipping related work, it's amazing to think that it's all gone now, and it's also a very sad thought. One other produce that Dennis hasn't mentioned was the seasonal banana traffic. As a result of this traffic, Dennis got his first mainline firing turn, due to a special train required to be laid down at the last minute. Joy of joys! Dennis was the next available cleaner, and Don Ginger Minton, who was a past fireman at the time, was on duty spare. Don cheerfully accepted him as his fireman for this trip to Westbury in Wiltshire. No mean feat taking this boy, who hadn't been past the starter signal at Weymouth. A Weymouth engine, which was a GWR mogul, number 7303, was to be their engine, and Don advised him how to get the best from it firing-wise. He excitedly prepared the locomotive, and they set off from the loco sheds to back onto their train in the goods yard, which was a fully fitted train of about 50 fully loaded banana wagons. Dennis's memory tells him that these trains were called Venlos, but can't find anything on that name but because they had vacuum brakes fitted throughout, he remembers that they could exceed the maximum 40 mile an hour rule that applied to unfitted wagons. However, they must have had an upper speed limit that Dennis couldn't recall, maybe 60 mile an hour. Weymouth sits at the bottom of a steep incline called Bincombe Bank. With a heavy train and a cold fire, it was testing for driver and fireman alike especially as at the top of this long steep climb sat Binkum Tunnel, a long dark and dank tunnel with catch points and a sand drag at the leading edge of the tunnel to stop any train that may slide back out from ending back down the bottom of the bank in Weymouth. In truth, they should have had assistance from a banker, but there were none available, so Don decided to go for it. A brave decision with a rookie fireman. However, the mogul dug its heels, or should I say wheels in, and stormed up the bank with Dennis keeping the boiler pressure on the red line to give Don plenty to work with. These little two-cylinder engines rocked from side to side when worked hard as the steam entered one cylinder and then the other. They entered Bincombe Tunnel at around about 25 mile an hour, working hard and held their breath so that she would not slip as they went through this half mile long tunnel. In the heat and smoke, it seemed a long half mile before they burst out the other end at the top of Bincombe Bank without a hint of a slip. From then on, Dennis started to enjoy the trip and marvelled how well it all went onwards to Westbury. Once there, they unhooked the engine and took a quick trip around the triangle to turn and headed back to Weymouth light engine, with Dennis grinning from ear to ear. What an unforgettable trip. Dennis had grown from a boy to a man in a day. It wasn't long before Dennis became a full fireman, because, as already mentioned, many of the older drivers were coming up for retirement, within a year or two of him starting work. So it was that past firemen became drivers, and past cleaners became firemen, and Dennis became Ivor Foote's regular mate. Here was a man who had steam in his blood. He loved his job, and... No doubt, this was instilled in him as a boy by his royal train driver dad, Hector. He was, of course, a Western man, through and through. God's wonderful railway was a phrase Dennis heard spoken for the first time by Ivor, and he meant it. He still enjoyed flashing the blade, so it was common for him to say, come on over here, mate, and with a pride fit to burst, Dennis would take on the driving role, and he would fire. 
He taught by example and would not necessarily tell you what to do or how to do it, but he would show you how to do it, and do it well he would. If they had a quiet few minutes in the yard on a shunting engine, he would get the paraffin and engine oil bottles out, and with some sand out of the sandboxes, he would start to clean the brass on the footplate until he could see your face in it. If they kept the same engine for a week, by the end of it, the footplate and fittings were gleaming. Dennis couldn't sit there and watch, but had to join in, so it was he that motivated him to take pride in what he did. He took time to explain the intricacies of any route that you were working on, so that eventually you knew exactly where you were, at any time of the day or night, in fog or falling snow. Dennis learnt his trade with Ivor, and as soon as they moved into the goods link together, they instinctively knew what the other wanted, whether it was more steam or less steam, or where to look out for the distant signal that the other could not see on his side of the engine. Leaving a station would see Dennis looking back to check they'd left safely, whether the station was on either side or his. All the little things that made life on the footplate a safer and more enjoyable place was done automatically without question. It became an art, and Dennis took pleasure in a job well done. One of the greatest jobs was working on the banker engine, and if working with a driver such as Pete Keane, it was a blast, literally. They would try and give the train crew a good start, and push them as hard as they could up Bincombe, but it could get tricky at times when blasting through Bincombe Tunnel, as not only did they have their own heat and smoke to contend with at the back of the train, they also had the lead engine's fumes, and at times it was difficult to breathe. On a really busy day, having shoved the train up the bank, only to find another waiting at Upway that they'd been sent on to await their arrival. So it was crossover, and off they go again, only this time much harder work, as they had a standing start right at the steepest point of the bank. Good job that Pete was keen by name and keen by nature. Another great bloke who always seemed to have a grin on his face. It was Peter who gave Dennis one of the best experiences of his railway life when they were booked together to work the Up Channel Island boat train one afternoon. This was a fast 12 coach heavy train that only stopped at Poole, all trains had to, and Southampton where a Nine Elms crew would be waiting to take over. Normally it was worked with a Merchant Navy class engine but often it could be a West Country or Battle of Britain class locomotive. On this particular day, Dennis cannot recall the engine, but it may have been number 35028 clan line, as she was shedded at Weymouth for several summers for this sort of role. What Dennis can recall was that they had a great start up the bank out of Weymouth, with a hearty shove in the rear by the banking crew. Exchanging double crows on the whistle at the start, they leapt up Binkham Bank and stormed out of the tunnel in fine fell. This made for a comfortable run as they ran happily through the Dorset countryside at speed. Dennis kept the fire built up and the engine ran like a Singer sewing machine. They stopped at Pool and then set off towards Branksome Bank towards Bournemouth. As they coasted past Bournemouth Central on the up through road, suddenly Peter leapt up and said, Come on then, mate. Dennis looked at him, astonished. He said, I'll do the firing, you know the road, she's all yours. Dennis always loved that fast run from Bournemouth through the New Forest to Southampton, and now he was going to drive the Channel Line and Boat Express on that route. It was like a dream as they rushed down through Christchurch, picking up speed as they headed towards Brockenhurst, with all signals set in their favour. By now, the valve gear was set very fine, and the regulator was on the first port, as the engine had gathered up its load and was running extremely well. They were travelling at about 85 mile an hour as they flew down the hill towards Brockenhurst Station with Dennis hanging on the whistle. The station and crossing gates went by in a blur, but if anyone could have seen who was at the controls they would have seen a young fireman sitting in the driving seat of this wonderful steam engine with his hand casually on the regulator with a huge grin spreading right across his face. It was all over far too quickly, and as they drifted into Southampton Central, they saw the Nine Elms crew waiting for them. 
Dennis managed to stop the train so that the engine was in the perfect position to swing the water column straight into the tender. Dennis thought that he couldn't speak for a time whilst they walked away from the engine to go and have a meal break, as it was an unforgettable experience for sure. Not all trips would be so enjoyable though, and another summer Saturday experience that started badly and got worse is another memory Dennis clearly recalls. His driver on this day was Alfie Parker, a heavy-handed driver who was also very religious. The closest Dennis had ever got to putting a shovel over a driver's head was with him. Dennis mentioned before that on summer Saturdays there were many excursions in and out of Weymouth. Many came down the western side, Swindon, Bristol and Birmingham. One working they had involved a Wolverhampton engine up and back, usually a haul and a Weymouth engine up or back, normally one of their standard class fives. They used to work a 12 coach heavy excursion up to Westbury, hard work but with a fresh engine it was okay, even with a heavy handed driver. Coming back was different, as the down engine had been hanging about for a couple of weeks if it was one of theirs. To be fair, as a mate, Alfie was always cheerful and amenable, but Dennis always thought his affability hid some insecurities and he was a bit of a worrier. They started the day by preparing the Wolverhampton Hall class loco that had travelled down a couple of weeks previously. As she had been used in place of their missing standard class 5, she was in good fettle. Dennis recalls getting up on the front of the engine to check the sandboxes and tighten the smokebox door. As Dennis swung on the smokebox door handle to tighten it, his hand slipped and he felt himself falling backwards off the engine. He narrowly missed falling into the service pit. The engine was standing over, but fell heavily, striking his head hard on the concrete surface of the pit road. Dennis thinks that he lay there concussed for a moment or two, when suddenly Alfie, who must have heard him fall, came round from the other side of the engine where he'd been oiling the motion. At this stage, Dennis was all for going to hospital for a checkup, but Alfie would have none of it, as he knew that if that happened, he would end up with a young cleaner as his fireman. You'll be all right, mate, he fussed. No need for a checkup. I'll look after you. Much against Dennis's better judgment, he very groggily insisted on making an entry in the accident book and tried to clear his head for the busy day ahead of him. The trip up to Westbury was heavy work, but fairly uneventful, even in spite of his sore head, as the hall performed well. After having their meal break, they went across to meet the down Wolverhampton and relieved a Bristol crew on one of their Weymouth Standard 5s, number 73018. Unlike the haul on the up trip, its fortnight away had seen it return to them in bad shape. The handover was poor, with mostly coal dust in the back of the tender, and they struggled from the outset. That did not stop Alfie hammering seven bells out of the engine, and by the time they got to Yeovil, about halfway, Dennis was on his knees. They then had the prospect of Evershot Bank to climb. Not a small slope by any means. They did have a banker for assistance, but Dennis thinks they did the lion's share. Dennis was now raking coal dust down from the back of the tender with no sign of any lumps, and they were hammering up Evershot with the mostly coal dust he was trying to build the fire up with, leaving the shovel straight through the tubes and out the chimney. Well, that's what it seemed like. Now picture this. Suddenly, Alfie, a red-faced 60-year-old, who was hanging on the wide open regulator at about 75% cut-off, suddenly starts singing, Onward Christian Soldiers. Dennis could quite happily have knocked his block off there and then with one swift blow of the shovel. He kids me not. 